Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Tap Calf Transmissions. My name is Justin. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Corey. Hello. Hello, Corey. Hello. And we have a very special guest today, the one and only, as you can see right on the screen, Alex from Star Wars Explained. Very special guest. Very special guest. If I had the technology for it, I would put in your intro or something, but it's just not there yet. <laughs> uh, do well, you want to tell us a bit day. about yourself for those who don't know? Yeah, I like Star Wars. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and so and I have a YouTube channel. Can you explain that a bit more? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about Star Wars. I try to keep up with all the new books and comics and shows and whatever's coming out every month and uh, talk about it and just stay on top of the lore. Mm-hmm. Partly for selfish reasons, so I can be good at trivia competitions, and uh, partly because now it's my job. Yeah. Um, so, when did you first read, I guess, any X Wing book or Star Wars Legends? Like, what's your kind of. Um, I think my first Star Wars book was Shadows of the Empire, because nothing makes a kid want to read like a tie in with a video game. So. <gasps> I thought you were going to yeah. say pheromones. And <laughs> yeah, <over>. sexy, <laughs> sexy lizards. <laughs> so, you're, you're here first. Yeah, I think my first Legends book was 96, so I would have been nine. And then uh, I remember just kind of going back to... I, I read chronologically, so I started with Truce of Bakura mm-hmm. and went. So I, I, I hit uh, Rogue Squadron pretty soon after that. So you basically did our podcast like I did it before way did. before you guys, but I <laughs> didn't have any alone. friends to talk about it with. <laughs> if it makes you actually, feel that's not. I actually did have a friend who like we would coordinate. Okay, we're gonna read through chapter X tonight, and we'll talk about it on the bus tomorrow. So, so the, we we did kind of do it, but even an even better version of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> um. So do you have anything fun coming up in the next little bit? Because obviously tomorrow is the big Disney show, hopefully some Mandalorian stuff. Anything else you want to talk about before we hop right into this lovely book? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just give a shout out to Dragon Con because it's the best time of the year. And it's in Atlanta where we are located and it's just a giant nerd party. It's like no convention you've ever been to before. It's more about like just... Just imagine like a giant Halloween party, but it lasts for Mm. four nights and it does not stop. Like, I remember the first convention I went to that was a normal convention. I was like, wait, it just stops at five (laughs) and then you have to like go to a bar somewhere else. (laughs) Like Dragon Con just goes nonstop. So, yeah, we're excited to do that, but uh, it it has become more and more work related as well. So I'm moderating yeah. a couple panels, but uh, this time I'm moderating the Q and A with uh, Jonas Suetamo, who plays Chewbacca. So I'm right, new Chewie. Super excited, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to get to just have some one on one time with him in front of like 200 people. <laughs> I think my favorite thing about Dragon Con, the version of Dark Empire that I have from like the like it's like one of the original runs from the nine. 90- has ads for like Dragon Con ninety four or That's something. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's just it's beautiful. Anyway, Corey, are you gonna talk or what? I have nothing to add right now. I'm just letting wow. this happen. Okay. You're the host um, for this week, so I hate being a host. I'm so bad at it. But uh I, I guess we'll move into the book then. <laughs> because it's a it's a fun one. I like it. Um anything you want to talk about first Corey, or do you want to uh, just yeah so the name of the book we're talking about this week is wraith squadron <laughs> yeah, uh that I would be probably that. a good thing to note it to uh bring up for everyone Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, it's, it's a star wars book it is once again back in the x-wing series so we uh we took a break last episode from the x-wing series to talk about darth plagueis and we are back with uh the second half of the X-Wing series is actually written mm-hmm. by a different author than the first half. Those were written by Michael Stackpole, and these are written by Aaron Alston. So uh, I guess we should talk a little bit about him before getting into the book right. too much. Do we know why the switch was made? Or was it was it just to bring new like life into the series? Because there's still so much of like Stackpole's Rogue Squadron story left to tell. And I guess some of that was in comics, but... Yeah, do, do, is there any like information on why the the switch was made? I have no idea. Was it? Uh, I I just assumed it was like Stackpole had a four story arc that he was like, "This is the story I want to tell," and then maybe he was done. But I don't know. 
Yeah, they've always kind of, or they always were kind of a, a writing team. So it was probably something that they'd planned themselves rather than band. Time, right. right. So yeah, I'm flipping through my essential readers guide. That's that sound, that slapping sound. If you guys can hear it. <laughs> he just gets very excited about X-Men. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> uh, but, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just while you're doing that. So mm -hmm. some of the other stuff people may know by Aaron Austin would include uh he did a third of the books for legacy of the force and fate of the jedi i think was he the yeah. only one or him and karen travis were both on both of those and uh yeah it, or it him was, and troy no, yeah karen travis was legacy of the force only then they swapped right. in um who did they swap in again for fate of the jedi um i'm not cheating no one can see that i'm cheating it was not christy golden yeah yeah not christy golden yeah so he did like big parts of legacy of the forest but really that's kind of troy denning's era if we're being honest yeah he also did two of the 19 yuzon vong war books so <laughs> uh good on him there but unfortunately he did one. die uh, yeah. a few years ago so uh this episode is dedicated to the memory of aaron alston i don't know if he'd want that just like based on what the last episodes have been like yeah that's fair <laughs> I don't want to get sued by his like his family. <laughs> I I had I never met Aaron, but I have heard so many people say amazing things about him that he was just nothing but the best person ever. So we we can at least say that. Yeah. Yeah. I he uh didn't he, wasn't his like uh I guess the illness or he had a heart attack or something wasn't it? A convention, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I heard. Yep. Well, rest in peace. He is sorely missed. These books are great, and I, I did, someone in the chat said that Enemy Lines One and Two are the best, or two are two of the best. I don't know if I agree, but I really appreciate because even when like later Star Wars stuff, like especially in the Legacy era, kind of got away from Starfighter combat. But anytime we'd have an Aaron Alston book, there'd always be rogues or wraiths or somebody in there, um, and there'd be a bit more focus on Starfighter combat. Like I think. I feel like one of the books, oh no, that might be one of Stackpole's books that starts with the simulator in New Jedi Order, but regardless, it was a it's a it's a real shame. Yeah, him and Stackpole both were basically the go to Starfighter combat authors of the EU, so mm -hmm. uh there's this and I think there's is it just Solo Command and, or Iron Fist and Solo Command after this before getting into No, uh, then we've got or yeah, yeah, just just two more and yeah. then because there's still Starfighters, Matamar, and Innistar's Revenge, but yeah. those come in after, uh, and Mercy some Kill other stuff. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's way later. <laughs> that's gonna that's be like a two, 2025 five podcast for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so what what did you guys? I guess I don't. Alex, you said it's been a while since you've read Rogue Squadron, right? A few years, like the uh, Rogue Squadron yeah, arc. Last, I guess last time I read the first four books was in i want to mm. say 2015 so it's been four right. years since i read those and then i just it, it pff, i can't remember the last time i read wraith squadron so this question might be a bit more for you Corey, but what do you think is different in like how alston writes versus how stackpole writes hmm <laughs> and that's I've, it guys. I've, got, the... I've got an answer <laughs> all right go for I, it i just think alston's funnier like or he's yeah. he he has a lot more jokes that mm -hmm. I think he's writing and then I think Stackpole is much more serious for most of the time. There's one one really funny joke that stood out to me is when Face is talking to I can't remember if he's talking to Zinge or one of the other Imperials and they cut him off like they just cut him off like mid sentence and then Wedge does the exact same thing to him like mm -hmm. a minute later and he, yeah he kind of like. It's less. I feel like personally that Stackpole goes for a bit more cheesy kind of like um, Top Gun. I, I've said that a bunch of times, like Top Gun esque yeah. um, stuff, which isn't really funny. It's just kind of almost like lighthearted in a way. Where as I found this book was a lot more serious. Like some of the pilots have some pretty brutal deaths, but there is also a lot more kind of direct funny humor in it with jokes or uh, whatever else. Yeah, I'd, I feel like some of the character development earlier on in Stackpole's books may have been a bit better, mm -hmm. uh, but I agree. some of the interactions between the characters end up being better in Austin's. 
Yeah, I'd say like I prefer I prefer Corin as a lead. Yeah. Than over yeah. Kel. I, yeah, I do discount too. Corin. Yeah, non force sensitive Corin. <laughs> Wait, Alex, did you say you disagree? No, I, I agree. Oh, okay. I, I like Corin Horn more than Kel Tainer. Yeah, and I'd say the stackable characters definitely see a lot more play later on. Um, the wraiths do kind of um, they do see some action, but a lot of it's kind of like in Wraith stories where you see like, I, th- I feel like you see Corrin especially, but even some of the others like Tycho shows up occasionally in other things. Um, you do like, you get that a little bit, but not that comes, as- uh, I think that a lot of that just comes with who they are or like what the squad is supposed to be. Whereas That's like fair. rogue squad and gets to borrow more from like the original heroism mm-hmm. mythos. It's kind of like uh justice, justice league versus suicide squad kind of deal. <laughs> Except, uh, <laughs> I guess both what of are we, those some were kind bad. of Wraith squadron? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah, get what that, you're saying, though. Yeah, I guess they're kind of, like, supposed to be in the background or, like, you know, slumming around somewhere. Yeah, Not... they're, they're supposed to be the ones that, like, uh, if they died, no one would miss them and they could do all this insertion. They had all these mm-hmm. other skills, but... Uh, they end up... A lot of them end up redeeming themselves or just by the end of the book, it makes it seem like the stuff they'd done to get uh, kind of blacklisted and then brought into Wraith Squadron wasn't that bad in the first place, Mm -hmm. which was kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the case with all of them. Like, is there anyone who does anything real? I mean, like, Kel probably shouldn't be flying. Uh, (laughs) Min probably shouldn't be flying. Um, I don't even remember. Like, what is, like, Fanon? I forget what he did. And some of them, yeah, like it doesn't seem like because there's when Wedge for so I guess we should give a bit of background maybe before we talk about the pilots. Well, um, that's kind of the, the start of the book is that Wedge wants Wedge has just gotten back from the events of the Bacta War where they've mm-hmm. taken down Assad. They're reinstated as part of the New Republic military. And rather than take up his position as the leader of Rogue Squadron, he has this new idea for a squadron that can use all the skills or that would be better suited for the kind of missions that Rogue Squadron had to do. Yeah. So that's kind of when like he starts a, building this. Yeah. So he talks to about when they were kind of creating Rogue Squadron. If two pilots were of equal skill, he choose the one with the better um like ground capabilities, like whether they were a sniper or some sort of commando or whatever else. So Rogue Squadron kind of ended up being really effective when they were on Coruscant and doing other missions. But this time around with with Raid Squadron, he wants to make a squad totally of um people who you know will be basically top on the ground and then also at least very good starfighter pilots or decent starfighter pilots i guess yeah (laughs) yeah but does he i don't know if he ever really explains why he wants the washouts though maybe just because yeah i don't do do you guys remember that like why he's going for washouts i think because he knows that they'll be more willing to do something mm-hmm. so weird like this that they'll he said they'd like be willing to do anything to get back into a cockpit right yeah and so if they're meant to be more of a ground team but you'll also get to fly mm-hmm. like that they'd be into that yeah i think wedge um, largely expected that they would not survive it was kind of it he never it was more of the subtext there that i got out of it maybe i was reading more into it than was there but it seemed like he did expect that this team would not really make it through much. Hmm. Yeah, he's like right there with them. I, I don't. Yeah, I know. I, I, I kind of felt that too because it's like it is some kind of suicide squad. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, he is right there with them, and you know, he he like Rogue Squad has just been incredibly successful, um, doing kind of like a very Wraith Squadron esque thing, like operating out of new republic official capacity so yeah interesting i I, yeah i kind of got that feeling too though so it the the book does kind of follow the same uh the same broader plot points that rogue squadron did at the start where Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much for the first half of the book if not the entire thing where you start off with getting together all these pilots and then training them they have a, a very similar training mission uh, where you're kind of following 
after Wedge says that he wants to form the squadron with Akbar, they have the uh before that they have the the kind of victory parade coming back to Coruscant and they're doing all the uh competitive starfighter acrobatics with rogue, <laughs> with the new rogue squadron. If there's anything you guys want to say about that before we uh I mean I that that, that was all so just the the competitive nature of it is so flyboy and how they just want to show off in front of everyone and like doing stuff that would potentially kill people. Yeah, that was my <laughs> what I was thinking the whole time. Like, what if someone fucks this up and they just yeah <laughs> blow up the city? <laughs> I like the I had to look up the word airsats because I feel like Alston used it two or three times and all it means is like fake. But I was like, who who talks like that? Yeah, who the only reason I knew word? about it was uh, it's one of the titles of one of the series of unfortunate events <laughs> books. Uh, I think Eck. I think we lost Eck. I figured he'd come back. Yeah, I was just gonna try to cover for him. <laughs> this always happens when he's the one streaming it. But anyways. All right, sorry about that, guys, and sorry to everyone who was watching this live. Unfortunately, the Eckhart Slaughter household suffered a loss of power, A-wing straight into the bridge, <laughs> and uh, yeah, my computer's down, and I'm recording this now from a mobile phone, so sorry about the loss of audio quality there. Yeah, we'll try to go yes. a, probably a little bit shorter, unfortunately, to make sure that he doesn't lose a uh, phone battery, but... Uh... Just scream every time you go down a percent. <laughs> I, I got a I got a power pack, so he should be he should oh. be okay for a while. But that is some modern technology just coming to the rescue there. All right, um, it's it's cozy now though too. Like I'm like all huddled in my office. Hey. It's pitch it's pitch black. It's my trigger <laughs> word. I know that's why I said it. Cozy. Yeah. Yeah. I what an I odd... described I described his YouTube channel as cozy once, and it was. I don't. Want... <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to get into that. Yeah, it, it's old wounds, <laughs> not like the yeah, not the Star Wars old wounds either. So, All right, we're not talking so about I the back we'll... war today. We're talking about Wraith Squadron. <laughs> so yeah, and I think the last thing we talked about before the tragic events of a couple of minutes ago was the formation of the squad, really, and choosing members and whatnot. And I was just wondering whether you guys had like personal favorites or least favorites. I think Piggy's my favorite of the bunch. Yeah. Yeah, Piggy's pretty great. Uh, Runt. Do you relate to him somehow? It's just weird. Do you relate to uh, Piggy somehow? What's going on? Why's he your favorite? Piggy? I mean, I like that Legends did weird stuff. And I don't think <laughs> Canon does enough weird stuff. But I like that they were just like, hey, let's... Uh, have a Gamorrean pilot, and how would that work? And they made it work, and I, I think that they should swing for the fences a little more in the new books. Yeah, I, I like, like that we get the reference it. to the Ewok before we get the Ewok. <laughs> yeah, Ewok pilot, <laughs> and like a lot of casual racism in that scene too. Not even casual, like overt racism. Yeah, like. <laughs> Come on, Wes, don't be don't be an idiot. This couldn't be happening. I do love uh, catch, like the whole the Ewok thing that cracked me up. Mm. Yep, yep, Commander. Yeah. yeah and yeah. that that like became a a callback throughout sort the rest of, of the story. Thing. It's weird that it became a callback through the rest of the story, even though like 90 percent of the characters doing it would have had no frame of reference for why that was funny. I figure <laughs> off screen they learned about it. Yeah. But if you're going to have the other non-West characters bring it up, maybe just have a scene of West mentioning it to someone. <laughs> um, yeah, I just like how Piggy's like casually dealing with like racism throughout the entire book, too. He's got, like, yeah. I, I, I forget if it's which of the rogues it is, like, takes offense to, like, being, like, someone implies that they're, like, a couple. Yeah, the, uh, just, with the Fallon, Chase I think it is. Yeah, where he's like, oh, well, someone makes a joke that they were just married or 
that's kind of yeah. the cover. Like, oh, would you have cared if it was face? And <laughs> just backs her into a corner. <laughs> Which is kind of terrible because they're supposed to be like incognito at that point, and like I forget who does it. It might be like Kel, Kel yeah. And they're like they're supposed to be incognito, and he like literally is drawing attention to them. <laughs> and he's like a Gamorian who can speak basic, so it's probably like not a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like I liked that scene and kind of what it was trying to say, but it never came up again. And I thought yeah. that oh, maybe we could explore this a little more and they didn't <laughs> yeah because they even have like later on they have him being like pretending to be their bodyguard and there's like would have been some room there for him to like be dealing with you know not wanting to be seen like that but don't really address it yeah I mean I uh, guess he's just like cool to play his part but I mean they treat him terribly <laughs> when when he's pretending to be oh, their yeah. guard Piggy's fun. Um, there's a few like that for me kind of just go under the radar though. Like, not a huge fan of like like Fanan or Fanan. Um, he's like the one with all the prosthetics. He's allergic to Bacta, which I think is why he makes it into the squad. He doesn't really do much for me. Um, Sand Skimmer, Phelan Sand Skimmer. She's also kind of one of those characters who they sort of set up a bit of like internal struggle or like depth to when for her it's like she's always second and she has a race with with wedge and she's second she's like second best marksman second best whatever and then at the end uh spoiler alert she's killed and um min who's another pretty good character is basically like ah oh, she'll never have to worry about being second again <laughs> <laughs> never no more self self-doubt is basically what he, he says he was the one that was like in love with her too and that was the best thing he could say about yeah. her there I feel like the the character development for most of the squad mates was better than you got in the later uh, Rogue Squadron books, but it was still it ended up being much worse than the than Rogue Squadron itself, like the the original Rogue Squadron book, okay. where it was about half the squad that never really got much beyond uh, a couple lines, and even Runt, who was kind of set up to be Oral Number Two, was yeah. you got a lot of Runt in the first few chapters but then he was gone until uh like i think two mentions in uh in the he, last couple he, chapters yeah he was really just there for the last fight to tell kel like i'm here to talk to your bad brain or whatever yeah and kind of <laughs> bring him back to the <laughs> which is it and they do something similar with rogue Squadron too because they always talk about these like basically these these pilots partnering up and teaching each other stuff like um i'm trying to think of another example um but basically like one one squadron member will have some sort of issue like astronaut will partner up in this obviously runt has the issue with he's got like multiple personalities basically and i feel like they could have spent a lot more time with like actually working through like hell actually helping him work through that but instead it's just like yeah there's an improvement but we don't really know why like you don't really get that sort of same off battle camaraderie that you do in rogue squadron one which is why that's kind of still one of my favorites yeah he gets over it very quickly like once uh kel has to give all of his points to runt it's like yeah. the next time they fly together it's like hey you look like you really got that under control and he's like, yep, <laughs> that's it. My big horse brain figured it out, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing we were talking about um, before we started recording, too. The uh, the book, basically, another some more of Aaron Alston's um, Alien, Star Wars Alien Xenophobia, where he says, Runt has features like a draft animal, except for the luminously intelligent eyes. And like, that's really insulting. Like, why just because he's horse shaped does that mean that he looks like a drafting? It's one of those weird things where, like, <laughs> yeah, it's racist in universe, but <laughs> is it in real life? Like, I don't know. From, from I, don't, I don't know the answer. Perspective, like, yeah, probably it, not. <laughs> yeah, but like, he's just trying to describe that this alien looks like a horse. <laughs> Yeah, and so that I we mean, understand it, but yeah, in the context of Star Wars, it's like, oh, look at Horsehead over there. 
<laughs> it's obviously Idiot. a terrible thing to say. Should be plowing a field instead of flying <laughs> a fighter. They talk about that a lot with uh, with Piggy too, where it's like, uh, no, that's not an insult in this squad because yeah, uh, they well. It, it was an insult before. Like, yeah, the people were insulting Porkins when they called him Piggy. Just... He was a fat dude with the last name Porkins. Like, <laughs> yeah, and they're like, don't, no, no, don't no. act like he this was it. not bullying just because the guy's dead now. <laughs> He's just not around to say like, hey, I hated it when you called me Piggy. <laughs> yeah, you know, after like after he left that interview, Wedge and West just like, Ugh. like, <laughs> gotta cover this shit up. <laughs> it's gonna be problem someday. <laughs> This is how we avert all HR problems. <laughs> no, no, Piggy wanted it. <laughs> that squadron list that Corin maintained of all the attractiveness levels of everyone in the galaxy, that was... Everyone was super on board with that. And Kel is maintaining that long, time-honored tradition. Of randomly being super aggressive with women, you mean? Well, that and also giving a... a not quite as clear of a list as uh, as we got with Corin, but there was the, yeah. the clear, Tyria is tier one, and of let's course. obsess over her. Mm. Uh, but other characters didn't quite get the same treatment, so, so that's nice. Yeah. But it's not like, yeah, it's not like, so, uh, Alex, when we were rereading, the, I guess we should explain this Corin's tier list thing. When we were rereading the X-Wing books, whenever there's <laughs> like a woman that joins the squad or is anywhere relevant, Corrin will literally rate her attractiveness yeah. compared to another woman. So you can actually go through and like rate four <laughs> of the women based on like how Corrin perceives them. Because that's just how that's just why how haven't you done this 90s. video yet? <laughs> Let's, you need to yeah. video. Oh uh, that's funny. Well <laughs> All in rank caps. one was a Salonian, so Oh yeah the, the ugliest <laughs> member of Rogue Squadron. <laughs> <laughs> Why Corin thought this Rogue Squadron member was the ugliest all caps. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. But yeah, this book gets a little bit away from that. It's a little bit less like talking about like kind of grossly talking about cleavage and stuff and um a little bit more it, it's it's less like silly than the original yeah, it it totally it doesn't go to it as often, but uh, the whole Kel and Tyria subplot is not yeah, fantastic. That comes out of nowhere because they don't and, like you. You feel bad for Tyria because like she's at one point she thinks she's the only woman in the squad, and then they get Phelan. But um, she's like, God, this is always what happened because she's being she like joins. She's being hit on by like three dudes. Um, Fanon, I think another guy, and then later, she, yeah, he tells her he's in love with her, and she's just like straight up, like, "How much did you think about me today?" And he, like, the dude is so dumb; he doesn't even lie about it. He's like thirty <laughs> minutes tops, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like nailed it. <laughs> he's like, oh, "Yeah, I got this one, baby." <laughs> she's like rolls so her flat. eyes. <laughs> later on, after she's like, after she explains that to him. Then he's just like, okay, I gotta make a mental note to think about her more. <laughs> he just completely yeah. misses the point. And then finally, towards the end of the book, when they finally decided, like, oh, you're right, I wasn't really in love with you. She's like, oh, that was a test. You've passed. I was in yeah, love with you I the whole now. time. <laughs> and then they have a kid but, together. But he never asked how much she thinks of him. That's hmm. true. That is a fair point. A very fair point. Kel has a lot of those, like, moments where he just, like, seemingly realizes something for, like, a kind of BS reason. Like, when he realizes Wes isn't, like, a total murderous douchebag because yeah. he heard him saying some stuff about... He heard him basically hiding Min's condition, or him and Wedge were conspiring to hide Min's condition. It's like, what, like Wes was being, like, n not a bro, but he wasn't a bad guy through the entire book. And He's just like, he's so weird because that scene to me is just so funny. Later on in the book, so as, as a bit of backstory, Wes kills uh, Kel's father because Kel's dad was basically like deserting in the middle of a battle. So Wes had to shoot him down or else they'd give away um, his position 
And then later on, so throughout the whole book, Kel kind of thinks that Wes has it in for him and is like some cold-blooded murderer. And then later on, he's working like up in the ceiling, like exchanging a light fixture or something. And uh, he hears Wes and Wedge talking and he jumps down off the ceiling and like confronts Wes and is like, okay, we're cool now. And then he just jumps right back in the that was, ceiling. That was such a fucking weird <laughs> scene. He literally jumps straight back up into the ceiling. Yeah. Like a like, monkey or something. How does he have that much lower body strength? It's like some Man. Naruto shit. <laughs> I was about to try to defend Kel and be like, I mean, he's probably a teenager and he's just like thrown into this adult situation and he's trying to figure out how it all works. But no, he's like 27 at this point. Same age as Wedge, basically. Like, he's way too old for this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he was in, like, they kind of retcon him into Rogue Squadron, like, the other books, because he was a commando kind of attached to Rogue Squadron. Yeah, yeah so I, I guess we should mention with, uh, right after Wedge has his meeting with, uh, or the, the original scene where Wedge is having his meeting with Akbar about making uh, Wraith Squadron, where he wants to make a squad that is like Rogue Squadron, but more ground-focused. Uh, we see Mendonos, who is one of the other eventual Ray Squadron members, as the leader of a, uh, a training squadron, Talon Squadron, and they get pretty much eviscerated by... Uh, Trigget? By Apoar Trigget, yeah. And uh, the what we later find out is soon tier Fells, uh, 181st, and totally not uh, someone else pretending to be soon tier fell, but uh, everyone else in his squadron dies. It's just him and his R two left. So that is he. That's what leads up to Wes and Wedge having to cover up for anything because he has like full on PTSD mental breaks during uh, during the book and like understandably uh, too. Yeah. <laughs> And Wes and Wedge are basically looking for any reason not to strip him of ever being able to fly again. And that's what Kel overhears. Uh, And up to this point, Kel would just be like frozen and assuming that Wes is just going to shoot him for the smallest infraction. Like there's even a part where uh, where Kel is told to fix parts on uh, Nightcaller, the Krillian Corvette they're stationed on. And he just assumes that that is... Wes and Wedge getting back at him, even though he's literally in the squad as a demolitions expert slash mechanic. He's literally just told to do his job, and he thinks it's a personal attack. Yeah, he he acts like a teenager, and that's why I'm like, oh my god, he was 27. What? Yeah, time to grow up, Kel. Well, the New Republic like desperately needed like some sort of mental health training <laughs> because the way they like the way they treat men, for example, is just like. They literally find out when they're about to form Wraith Squadron that his entire squad has been wiped out. And then, like, as they're forming it, they're like, well, I'm sure he's ready for a new squad. Like, and then, like, he's having these, like, emotional breaks. And they're like, eh, <laughs> just, give him, just, like, give him some time. Like, he's got serious, like, PTSD, like, crippling. Because, like, it's pretty... He loses his entire squad. He's the only surviving member. And, I mean, it's pretty brutal. One of the deaths is, um... Is... He's with, like, his wingmate, and she tries to eject from her... I don't remember what they're flying, an X-Wing, maybe. And the canopy closes, and he just sees her, like, smash against it and die. And then, like, yeah, maybe he's not cool to start, like, fighting again. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> maybe. Wedge basically asks Akbar for people who will have gone through stuff like that, or were, like, next to being thrown out of the unit, or thrown out of the military entirely. And he does literally nothing to account for that the entire time he's playing the squadron. It's basically yeah. left to all of them to fend for each other. And <laughs> it's just really bad planning. It's it's kind of like that scene in the too, Simpsons. Like... Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, it's kind of like the the thing in The Simpsons where Mr. Burns is going to the doctor. Like, you have... <laughs> every disease and they're all trying to shove through the door at once it's the only thing keeping you alive <laughs> even the slightest thing that sets it off balance will kill you indestructible they're saying Wraith Squadron only functions because they're all so broken basically yeah 
the fact that like when Min is having his later breakdown that the rest of the squadron they just everyone else just forces him into the simulator to force him into yeah, think he's in, he's in Talon Squadron. They wait for that to happen, and then they start like mm-hmm. talking to him as the rest of his squad mates. Like, oh, forgive yourself, and then <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, they like it's just that's horrible. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but they must have yeah. just what pulled him out of bed, carried him, shoved him into really the simulator yeah, like, while he was comatose. Like that's so messed up. <laughs> yeah, it's like imagine like you're like in. I don't know, like a Vietnam veteran and all your buddies died and you wake up one morning, you're like you're in the middle of the jungle with you know, your old blown up buddies being like, oh, you must forgive yourself. Like, It's not how that works, I don't think. <laughs> it could make it way worse. <laughs> well, not for Mendonos. No, he kind of, he does kind of snap out of it. And then at the end, because um, Min and um, Sand Skimmer kind of start a little thing together and then he loses her pretty quickly after they start to give into their feelings and he's like eh i'm kind of over it though i just killed the dude yeah as soon as there's like a certain threshold everyone in the squadron needs to uh needs to meet and then they're fine like as long as they meet those minimum requirements all their problems are solved and it's all good like for for cal he just needed to be allowed to run away from a battle at some point and (laughs) just like he's good yeah, <laughs> like don't worry, you're all you're all gonna die. Thing. Half the squad died in this battle, but you know what? I went for a walk, and we're 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 all fine now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's honestly, and like Wedge well, doesn't really understand because obviously Kel's got some like serious anxiety issues, and he just the way he deals with that is just by coming in and like yelling at him. It's like pull yourself up yeah. by your bootstraps, basically. I don't like you very much right now either. <laughs> Have you tried not being sick or not being stupid? Like, <laughs> There's no. people in the squadron with actual problems. Yeah. It's like, what are you... Yeah, he's like, he basically hospital shames him. <laughs> yeah. Medical treatment shames him. I don't believe mental health is a thing. <laughs> basically, yeah. Um, but yeah, so they kind of get this band of misfits together, but it kind of works out pretty good. The first battle, I think that they they do basically as well as Rogue Squadron did in there. For, well, not quite as well, but because they never are really against the same kind of odds that Rogue Squadron is. But who like I forget how many fighters they are going against in their first their first one. Uh, I mean, they had a Star Destroyer coming at them. Oh right, it would be, it would have been the defense of um, Full War, right? Is that the first? Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically they're, they're stationed in this, like, is, is it a moon? Is Fuller's a moon of Commodore? Of Commodore, right? yeah. Right. So they're stationed in this moon, um, and the moon actually appears in the first book of the series too, and it's just basically, they train in there. That's where Corrin did, like, his, um, his run, and he gets pissed off because they steal his data and stuff. I think that's actually where the series opens on Fuller, I guess. But um, it's pretty close, yeah. Yeah, Wraith and Rogue both get trained and basically, or both get formed in the same place, and they do they do some similar setup scenes with that, where uh, you get Corrin being upset about his scoring, uh, and then you get uh, Cal kind of being in the same situation where he's paired with Runt, who is uh, really bad at everything. Like he has multiple minds that one will take over. And uh, you get whatever score your wingman gets. So uh, Runt gets Kel's score zero. and Kel gets zero oh, yeah, because yeah, of yeah. Runt. So you get basically the exact same little uh, little sequence where Kel is upset about the score he got. <coughs> and then um, Wedge, or in this case West, is just like, well, you learned some today, didn't you? And they're like, I guess so. That I'm a I'm dick. Then he walks <laughs> <guess>. off. <laughs> um, so then they're planning, I guess their next thing they're doing is, I guess it starts off being like a test for their astro navigational abilities. And then it turns into when they're out there, um, Yasmin or Jasmine Akbar, who's Ad- Admiral Akbar's niece, um, in the communications expert of the team, uh, she kind of figures out that there is a star destroyer coming. So what turned what was originally an astro navigational exercise turns into a defense of the planet. 
Well, be- like- before we get into that too much, uh, just with Wedge's general training style, is does he just turn into more of a dick with this? With this yeah, book? Yeah, I think so. Because <laughs> with, uh, with Rogue Squadron, after he did that to Corrin, he pulls him into his office like, you see what I was doing there? And kind of explains what the <laughs> lesson was. But with Wraith Squad, he's just like, yeah, sucks to suck, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he beats Sand Skimmer in a race, and he's like, well, got you, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me old again. <laughs> yeah. Now you, now Come you on, know, Wes. Now you have to cheat. <laughs> Go hang out yeah. with the cool kids. <laughs> he just like rationalizes why you're allowed to cheat. <laughs> the Empire um, won't play fair, Missy. You see, Fallon, if I hadn't cheated, I would have lost. Now do you see what I'm <laughs> trying to show you? <laughs> he's very brutal about it. He's like, just like the example he uses. He's like, when the Empire shoots through your canopy and blasts your guts all over your X-Wing and I've got to clean it out by hand, will you be mad that they cheated? Yeah. She's just like, Jesus Christ. When your like, squad mate ejects their seat. <laughs> Isn't that right, Donos? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Donos, what do you think about fair? Yeah. He's just lying He's there just cold like up the <laughs> There's also that scene that is- when Torillion is like meshed onto the mashed onto the ceiling of Nightcaller. He's like, hey Donos, remind <laughs> you of anyone? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um that also shows some... We were talking earlier about uh, Kel's amazing jumping abilities. In that scene, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Vroot, or Vort, I mean, basically jumps up, somehow climbs a TIE fighter and jumps through the ceiling. Um, so there's some pretty unreal jumping abilities in this entire book. and It's just something that I thought was really important to share with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they are evacuating Fuller. They need to uh, make some extra time because... Uh, the I think it's called Borlaeus, the the yeah. last transport. It's having engine issues, so they kind of come up with a plan to lure the star destroyer to the other side of the planet. Where uh, is it? Runt that goes with with Kel, uh, yeah, and then the two blue squadron waiting. pilots. Yeah, and they yeah, because Runt saves them on the way. They decide to uh, impersonate Han and Leia, where <laughs> they're trying to make a, a juicier target for Apwar Trigit to go after, and uh, they're just horrible actors, but they're able to kind of spoof the the nav signal. Yeah, and then Star Destroy turns around, everything is Gucci, and then they run back through the uh, the trench, and that's when like um, Runts. I guess it's like a third personality. I think he calls it a student personality or something, or his yeah comes through and kind of leads him through through the explosions and stuff, and basically Runt takes him to safety because I think he's pretty much ready to die at that point. Because he's like he doesn't really Kel doesn't really have like a fear of because throughout this whole book he's dealing with like anxiety and he like is, sometimes he's unable to perform. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's mostly it's mostly related to when people are relying on him. Um, more than more so than like a fear of death. So like, for some reason, once he's kind of accomplished what he needs to do, then kind of pressures off and he's able to escape and he feels good. But then throughout the book, whenever he needs to do something and people are relying on him, even if even if it's just like fix the ship, he starts getting like really stressed. Out. Yeah, he's waiting for failure, and then he's waiting for West to kill him for his failure. Yeah. So he was washed out because of several like uh, mechanical failures. And yeah. the, so I want to make sure I was understanding that those were all user error, right? That was yeah. him yeah, getting freaked out. He seems to suck when he's not in the simulator. Because even when, I think his first time flying is like, he's like, oh, they're shaking. And then he's successful. And he... Yeah, like they, they really focus when he's in the, the first simulator run on being like, oh, well, why are all these other people nervous? This is just a sim. But then you get to the actual flying mission and he's just frozen for the first few seconds at least before they actually get engaged. So, I guess after they manage to turn away the Star Destroyer, they do the the kind of rendezvous they were planning anyway with the astro navigation um, test or whatever. 
but and by the way, of course, it's Piggy who's at like genius level intelligence because of some test performed on him by the Empire. Um, they end up getting pulled out of hyperspace by these. They're they're kind of like a, a few different kinds of mind, a few different kind of minds. They have like interdiction capabilities, but they also ping an enemy ship when they pull somebody out, and they let off like a really powerful ion burst to rise entire ships. Um, and this scene was like the one that was for me most different from Rogue Squadron, because they're kind of like sitting in space and they're like trying to figure out a way to save themselves, and it's kind of like the whole point of Rogue or sorry Wraith Squadron is they're supposed to be able to think on their feet and do stuff like this, and it's the first time you really see them come together and kind of create a pretty crafty situation to get out of it, or a pretty crafty way to get out of their situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, Wedge basically just asks uh, asks Cal if he's ever seen anything like it or if he knows what it is, and Cal pretty much rebuilds uh, the mine out of everything it did, and he kind of infers that there would be the uh, the like the burst the communication burst to let whoever know that it had gone off because basically the mine is supposed to be a trap. It goes off, shuts the ships down that come in. It's put at a place that it's that a ship is likely going to jump into the system so it could be a bit less powerful and then it just alerts whatever ship to come and deal with whatever's left so yep. they start making a plan to deal with uh whoever's going to go check on their remains which they assume is probably going to be implacable itself but mm-hmm. instead nightcaller a modified Krellian corvette comes out which is uh mostly just a Krellian corvette that's been turned into a like a light carrier yeah, and like a mine layer too, I think. Yeah, so they uh, they come up with a plan on how they're going to get into whichever ship it, uh, whatever ship comes after them, where they're going to try to insert one person, Piggy, uh, while the rest of them kind of play dead. And it's a pretty ridiculous plan too. <laughs> yeah, and they in the middle of space they build this device, the lunatic. It's so like a Gundam, basically. I, I put yeah. in my notes, it's like, this is the closest Star Wars will have to getting Gundams. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like a coffin uh, with a, a laser cannon on it, right? Pretty much. Yeah, basically. With, like... He's got, like... <laughs> it's One thing about this book, though, is they're able to do such, like, advanced mechanical stuff so quickly. He's like, yeah, we've, we've uh, somehow managed to bring the, like, anti... Um, they're like the electronic countermeasures package is installed in here. We've got satellite TV. We've got <laughs> boosters attached to your data pad. We've got a big ass gun. <laughs> uh, oh, and, the, and an astromech droid, right? Yeah, and an astromech. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for me, I was I was a bit confused about that because initially it seemed like their plan was to get like whatever whoever was in there kind of sucked up by the tractor beam and brought into the hangar, and then they would you know do whatever damage from in there. But I, I think later, when it actually comes to it, Piggy kind of just shoots himself in there, right? Like with the rocket uh, or the thruster, and because like why would a, why would a ship like suck that coffin in? Like if it was a starfighter, it makes sense. But if it was like, or if it was like a dead person, it would make sense. But why would they just suck in a piece of, piece of space debris? Right. I think the original plan was to make it look like space debris, and they would just collect all of it. But then they were like, right. they would scan and see someone live. So then, yeah, Piggy, that, that's why they needed the astromech droid, so it could help make, like, calculations and adjustments right. for yeah. the lifting. Piggy's like, let me do it, I'm thick. And he's, like, like clapping his ass, <laughs> like, winking at them. He's like, humans might not like it, but, like, this thickness comes in use. <laughs> it's just, yeah, that, that's how I have I that in my it. notes as, like, weird flex that, for you humans, <laughs> all this extra fat would be seen as undesirable. But for me... <laughs> But yeah, Piggy okay, goes Piggy, in there and just gonna... wrecks the entire crew of the CR-90 while they're also assaulting it from their X-Wings, what's left of their X-Wings. Yeah. And yeah. like the the captain, Zerl Dorelian, is pretty much literally scraped off the ceiling by the time they're done. <laughs> yeah, because they've got like this modified X-Wing, because they, they take the, the blaster can on one of the X-Wing and like break it down to its component parts kind of make it into a weapon that Piggy carries and he blasts through the ceiling and well accidentally 
obliterates one a person. Of the, uh, yeah. <laughs> like no regret or anything. <laughs> all his all his big Gamorian cheeks are clapping throughout the ship. <laughs> it's a I power. Know. I, don't, I don't know. It's not canon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's legends. <laughs> um <laughs> This is, yeah, uh, so- it needs to be turned into one of those animatics they were doing for uh, all the best moments of Star Wars history. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Just, like one of Piggy the uh, galaxies. Yeah. <laughs> twerking <laughs> while blowing up a CR-90 from inside. Gamorreans are so thick, though, because they're like, they're like pear-shaped. Like, like this, you might not like it, but Gamorreans are peak performance. Like, because <laughs> Piggy is fast, he's strong. Between absolute him unit. and like, yeah, absolute Gamorian unit. <laughs> Him and Hohash, they're like, they're the like beast of nasty. burden. <laughs> yeah, beast <laughs> of burden. <laughs> That's right. Um, there's got to be some fan. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna looking up Hohash fan fiction after this. Oh, God, <laughs> I'll talk about it next. Time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's just like the third episode of Tap Calf, right? <laughs> yeah. <Basically. laughs> so they get uh, they get the night caller. And Grinder, their Both and Slicer, with a, a name that's only aged well. Uh... <laughs> Most subtly, like gay, like squadron in the New Republic. <laughs> uh, so Sorry. he realizes they haven't sent. Uh, there was no time for them to send out any indicator that they got attacked. So as far as Zinj's fleet is concerned. Nightcaller is still doing its job, and they have all their information on what the what the Nightcaller was supposed to be doing next. So, Raid Squadron basically commandeers the CR ninety, stations themselves on it, uh, and because it was modified into a carrier, they have room for all their X wings, and uh, they basically start going along the uh, the predetermined route for uh, for it's like stronger Nightcaller, people, yeah. Basically. So they're doing what Zinj said. For anyone that is kind of like reluctantly going along with what Zinj was having them do, they were just trying to get information from. And mm-hmm. for anyone who is like clearly enthusiastic about serving Zinj, they just send the information back to the New Republic and then Rogue Squadron uh, and uh, other New Republic elements would come in and just wreck them. And no one really caught on within Zinja's fleet to what they were doing yeah. for a while. Just, <laughs> this is curious. Everywhere that Nightcaller goes, the New Republic is suddenly attacking. <laughs> Weird how they got X-Wings in their hangar. <laughs> <laughs> At but, one point, um, is it just me? Do, do I misremember this? Or do they like tape panels on the side of their escape craft? Inside their hangar at one no, point. No, they definitely did that to make it look like the missing TIE fighters. Right. So, but that's kind of weird because when the hangar, because it seems like the hangar can open and close at will. Because, like, there's a bunch of scenes where they talk about it opening. Well, they were putting those ones on the escape pod uh, yeah. racks. Yeah. Because they were still converting that for use as a, uh, as the actual hangar because they had a lot more starfighters and right. they were all. One of the best subplots of the book is how concerned everyone is about flying in and out of the hangar. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's they did a do a lot of construction. Yeah. I kind of like that, though. It, it reminded me of, like, Rogue Squadron 1, how a lot of the book is about, like... Or, sorry, X-Wing 1. How a lot of the book is about, like, them getting assets and, like, getting their squadron together and, like, getting new bases and stuff. And this was, like, they've got this ship and they constantly make upgrades. They got new fighters and it's, like... Like, how are they going to use the assets they have? Who's going to use the TIE fighter for this mission? Who's going to use the X-Wing? Who's going to be in the Lambda? I, just, I don't know. I, just, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, so they... Uh, one of the things they make is... Uh, so they have Garrick Face Lauren, a famous Imperial... Or famous former child star <laughs> and actor extraordinaire who is... Uh, who takes up the role of Zerad Dorelian using the assistance of a deep fake program made by Grinder the Slicer uh, to project Darillion's face. He like 3D models Darillion and it's like those old programs where you could like have a whatever animated character take your face in a webcam. Yeah. Uh, they do that with Darillion so we can talk to Tridget and Zinge. It's so and funny. Just... I put deep fake as notes too. <laughs> 
there's the most over the top caricature caricature of an imperial officer and Apwar and Xander are both like, no, this is definitely that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wound my but pride, it, Apwar. Yeah. It, and then later he has like that part where he's talking about his his secret love for Isar. I thought that was Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh he smelt of musky. <laughs> and that's that's to get Trigget back into believing yeah all real. Like, that was that was when so he forgot the uh the best way to lead line yeah. i think oh, it was yeah. the best way to yeah. follow is to lead right what do they call that again like a secret there's a word for that it's like a a secret code that is like signifies that you're a member of an in group yeah like, you know in uh... glorious bastards when they do the uh um What's it called? Like you know, like in *Glorious Bastards*, when he puts up his a shibboleth, yeah, he puts up like a three, but he does it the American way, or like yeah. a, a three fingers instead of the shibboleth. Yeah. So I, I wasn't listening to you when you were saying that. I was too distracted by how fucking hot Isar is. <laughs> <laughs> Smelled like freshly cleaned stormtrooper armor. And it's funny too, because the uh, the other Imperial is basically like. That is what she's like because he had met her when he was young, when he was a still a child star. He says, like, his knowledge of Isard convinced me, basically. <laughs> He's like, yeah, she smelled like pine salt. I just remember reading that, like, <laughs> this is never going to work, and then it works. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I, th- I thought it was, like, a good, finally, like, Triggett's caught on and we're going to get get into that. But nope. nope. <laughs> they get all that weird uh, off-character acting for Darillion, and then they have the battle where someone has clearly tipped P- the New Republic off. They have mm-hmm. Darillion's ship getting followed by the New Republic, and not once do they consider, <laughs> <laughs> wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. A little <laughs> no sketchy. wonder they lost the war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. I gotta say, though, the whole scheme they make up to basically avoid hanging out with the other ship crew is, like, so over-the-top and ridiculous. It's like, yeah. they don't want to go out for coffee, so they... Like, Let's go engage in biological world. warfare. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're like, okay, they want to come visit us. What's the only option we have? Poison their whole crew with <laughs> biotoxin and steal TIE fighters. <laughs> like, could, could you not have just, like... Kel's like, like maybe we could try something else, and Wedge is like, no, it's the only way. You know what would have been a lot <laughs> easier than that? Just telling them that their ship was infected. Yeah, we're all sick. Diarrhea. It's not good. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> it's like the excuse. If you ever just self-admit that you have diarrhea, people will just No be one's so going to question shit. that. Yeah. Like, oh, shit, man. All right, well, maybe next time. <laughs> So like get the coordinates wrong or something. Like, I don't know. It's got to be a better situation than that. Because it's like a whole. It's a, it's a whole thing too. Because they've got to make disguises to go down this plant. They break into a like a high tech disease research facility. <laughs> That's like a hundred pages of the book too. Yeah. But um, uh... Wedge is like dressed up as a yokel with like a Minnesotan accent. Oh yeah, he <laughs> says. Oh yeah, that I did like that. <laughs> Where can three, we find the wires? Yeah. <laughs> but they Good. initially when they're following along their, their route, we get the first loss of a Wraith Squadron member. Uh there's oh, a yeah. scene where Jessman Akbar is talking to Admiral Akbar about how uh maybe if she listens to Wedge she'd have no reason to cause him that grief of losing a niece. It's like, <sighs> okay, you're you're immediately yeah, going to you die, know. aren't you? <laughs> So they go to M two nine M Z nine. I can never remember. It's in it's in Thrawn's Revenge, how but can I can you, never remember. How can you never remember that random four character designated? But anyways, <laughs> there are some pirates there, and they the pirates attack Singe's forces. Like, okay, this is a clear sign that we need to kill all of them because they're in for... Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Why didn't they just leave? Like, okay, sweet. Like, like they don't like Zinj. Yeah. Cool. But instead, they decide to fight them all. They were beating all the fighters, and then some artillery rolls up on a cliff and <laughs> yeah. nukes Akbar. You're you're in a starfighter. Fly above them. <laughs> like, um, Akbar's got a really shitty life in Legends. Like, worse than canon. Hmm. Jasmine like, or or. <laughs> G-all. Admiral Akbar. Okay. Yeah. Like, he gets blamed for blowing up that, uh... He's blamed for, like, a massive tragedy and when he blow when, they, when he's framed... Yeah, the, the the Tower of Glass or whatever. He gets, like, screwed up by Thrawn during the Thrawn campaign. Um, Mon Calamari gets bombed, like, no less than 35 times. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and then he it's... Finally has, <laughs> yeah. He finally has some retirement. The Yuuzhan Vong invade, and he like dies before they he, they get ultimate victory. Cian Sav like, is too incompetent to do his job without him. It's like a goddamn shame. <laughs> it's a <laughs> guy's off screen too. They're like Akbar's dead. Oh, shit. Is it uh, dark? No, it's the uh, Jedi Academy trilogy when Leia's on Mon Calamari, looking for then ends up finding Silgal. And her and Silver, yeah. are, as Akbar <laughs> yeah. is retired or trying to stay out of everything, it's like, yeah, that's after. Come to his, my labs, uh, Leia. Welcome. The bottom of the ocean. Yeah, it's like his self. That's his self exile after. Want to see some season. algae? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just lots of bad shit that happens to him. Like he's got, he doesn't have a good go. He really doesn't. No loved ones besides his one niece, who's like brutally killed. Well, Silgo is across- related to him in some way, but. No one seems to care. Oh, yeah. It's... But, uh, yeah, so Silgal... Or, not Silgal. Jasmine. <laughs> Jasmine is more. getting blown up. Kel tries to save her by, like, hooking his wing into her wing to try and, like, loop and slow her down. But her uh, inertial compensator, which basically reduces all the G-force, has G-force. broken... And she's just knocked unconscious, so she can't pull out of anything. Uh, and she ends up crashing into the planet, and Kel blames himself, uh, thinking yep. that he should have been able to save her. And the rest of the book is just waiting for someone to kill him or tell him how much he sucks for not being able to save her. Even though he gets like a Medal of Honor and Akbar personally thanks him. Yeah. At one point, Wedge is like, don't blame yourself. Blame the imp who shot her down, or, or sorry, the pirate who shot him down, or the Empire for making us do this. Or, or blame her. her body for failing and not being able to maintain consciousness. I was like, Jesus Christ, Wedge. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she's just dead. <laughs> she's still smeared across the surface. <laughs> blame her for not being a very good pilot, Kel. She deserved this. <laughs> Look me in the eye, Kel. If it got, like, what if it got racist again? You're like, blame her stupid fish eyes. <laughs> she can't see straight. She can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Uh, speaking of fish eyes, we don't get many. There's a couple things we don't get in this book. We we have no tap calf references, and that's. I went back and checked, and this is the second one, um, including Bakura, where there's none. And we have no Akbar water mat metaphors. And generally, Actually, I thought Akbar wasn't written very well. Not okay. Not to the same degree. And I didn't think Akbar was written that well in this one. Didn't so, like it. one of the one of the better subplots of uh, Tap Calf Transmissions as a podcast is that uh, Eckhart gets annoyed by any mention of Krellians and odds, and I do as well because it, it comes up a lot. In this book, <laughs> that gets book. subverted, where <laughs> the only mention is uh, where at some point Wedge says even a Krellian would. Listen to those odds. They still can't goddamn control themselves, even if it's just one. Like, <laughs> but early on in the book, when they're talking about all the candidates for for the pilots, there is a Quarren named Trigor Sluss. And do we know what happens to Trigor Sluss? No. What happens? He was washed out. <laughs> okay, Corey. I don't know if that's a water reference. <laughs> It absolutely that was a clearly chosen word for the Quarren. I, th- I think you're right because I think I did take a note of that. Um, I do like at the end though how Akbar is like standing on the beach, just like looking like 
sadly at the ocean. <laughs> he like wants to go swimming basically. <laughs> like he's like waiting for someone to like be like, go on, like take a dip. <laughs> like, he's been spending his day like in a hot room on the freaking I don't know, a big like slightly damp room on home one. He just wants to go for a goddamn swim. <laughs> I I love every scene between Wedge and Akbar in these books. I don't know what it is. I just every time they talk to each other, it's great. And I even one of my notes was just uh the friendship between Wedge and Akbar is great, but later on in the book, Wedge is like, We're not friends. <laughs> but yeah. I do respect it. <laughs> yeah. Let me believe, like yeah, don't, being friend, but he's don't like, take no. this away from me, Wedge. I'm not Kel. I don't deserve your derision. <laughs> uh, I don't even remember where we were in the plot. Um, so, uh, Jasmine just died. <coughs> and right after that, they are still following the route, and we end up at the mission to get uh, with all the transparent steel. Oh, uh, yeah. They need to blow that up for some reason. Actually, I think that was before Jasmine died, but either way. Um, probably. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, her skills like communications, right? So I don't remember if she helped. Was it on that mission or Stornall where uh, Fallon gets to flip over a TIE fighter? She got to be the first person to flip over a TIE fighter. Uh, I don't remember, to be honest. All the missions kind of. Like it, the missions do the same thing that like the rogues, the X Wing books do before now. They kind of don't advance the plot a lot. It's just like, so to me, they kind of run together because it's just like this is yeah thing that happens. If you skip those sections, it doesn't impact your ability to understand the book. It's yeah, there's a, like, a little bit of the character development, but yeah, yeah, exactly. So I guess that does bring us to. When we're starting to hear about getting together to attack uh, in the preparation for what ends up being the Battle of Marobe, where uh, they end up on Storinol for uh, their mission to get the biological warfare agents, and mm -hmm. I believe they needed two more TIE fighters so they could restock the Nightcaller's complement and not be uh, not have their cover blown too early. Yeah. So they want like they want the disease that will go through the other um other crew. Um but they don't want it to be too serious because they don't want people to get sick. But, like honestly you probably could just like take a crap in like the ship's vents or something. Jeez. Or like <laughs> I don't know, just like 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 gave one of the crew members pink eye or something. Like there'd be easier ways than break into like a high tech like thing with like a self a high tech disease containment building with like a attached nuclear bomb that will go off like and they they almost uh screw up the tie fighter section too because face ends up saying uh eyeballs that they, they've got two eyeballs uh, yeah. coming back which is the new republic oh, yeah. fighter jockey term for tie fighters like that, yeah. yeah that was pretty cool. well that one they actually did catch on and they, yeah, yeah. Face was like, "We've been made." So those guys are a lot smarter than Trigget. Yeah, Faye, There was a scene <laughs> that was in the original edition of the book. I don't know if anyone still has that copy. Where after that happens, Face just starts talking about how hot a sard is, but <laughs> it didn't work this time. Dude, have you seen the legs on old Iceheart there? And they're like, "Oh." Like, Did you know she has a blue eye move? and a red eye? <laughs> There, he's right. She does. It must be him. <laughs> that checks out. Someone check the hollow net. We gotta see if that. <laughs> yeah. Um. That whole like, it seems like they're kind of enjoying their time on the. Uh, what's the planet called again? It's like it's like a Storm. resort world, I guess. Yeah, because like, Wes is like, yeah, I'm gonna go order room service, and some of the other like Wedge and the others are like buying rounds and stuff. I am sure they're not actually drinking or anything, but. Oh, yeah, and they were putting it all on the New Republic tab. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hold on, what's Frisky Bothins 3? Like, Wes, <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what did you buy? How did that advance the mission? Corrin <laughs> suggested it. <laughs> yeah. We also get uh, 
before around the time of this and the later climactic battles, we get a bit more of the of the prank wars that go on in the squadron. But we later find out is Grinder doing it. But uh, there, one of the pranks is like a, a blow up doll with a knife attacks Fallon when she's. <laughs> That was like such a, a weird knife. subplot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it it seemed like something where you were supposed to be like, who's doing the pranks? But I kept forgetting that pranks were happening until a prank yeah. happened. Yeah. And I'd be like, oh yeah, that's going on. It was such a it came up like twice and it was such a minor thing until you get to what is supposed to be the like the culmination of all these warfare. plots, but you have these weird the uh, several page digressions with Grinder about this worm. Yeah. Like, okay. Why is this all being shoved in now? And then he gets like vaporized by a turbo laser. So like, oh, this is this is why. We also talk about the fact that he's always like walking around naked. Yeah, like, that's that's weird. Answers well, so is Chewie. Just... Answering the door and he's hanging dong. That's true, but Chewie <laughs> Chewie has some modesty because it's I don't like, think, think Wookiees have Bane genitals. The... Trust me, they do. <laughs> oh, they have genitals. <laughs> So you should be thankful I got that fur. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that robot chicken sketch where they go meet Chewie's family and they open the door and everyone's wearing like full suits and dresses yeah. and stuff? And Han's like, "What the hell?" <laughs> no, but that sounds hilarious. <laughs> Chewie, you freak! <laughs> but Fanon's like, "Did you, are you like? Did you, are you gonna wear a towel this time?" So like, I don't know. That's like. You shouldn't be doing that to your to your squad mates. Like, Fanon, don't. What do you know about this? Why aren't you wearing pants? There's no time. <laughs> At least put your hand down, Jesus. Nasty <laughs> <laughs> old bosses. That's a classic boss and power move too. You know, Boris <laughs> Felia one day just showed up in the Senate, just like. <laughs> It's my tradition, he, baby. Who's yeah, gonna, who's gonna call me on it? <laughs> like, yeah, this is just what Bothans do. You racist. <laughs> we swore an oath of Trevi, which means first of all loyalty, second of all no pants every second Monday. <laughs> Get used to it. Grinder's family swore our cry against pants. I wonder if there's any. Speaking of Bothans, the Bothan families tend to be very interconnected. I wonder. How far you have to go to connect Grinder and Borskphalia? Dude, like, I wonder did if there's we get a Grinder's real name anywhere? Probably. I think so. I think at the very beginning. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to search Grinder on my. <laughs> Star Wars Grinder. <laughs> Earth Three Ag. I don't recognize that last name. Uh, but yeah, so we end up next at the mission firmer. The Battle for Marobe, where that is where all the Faller base people have relocated to. So the Borlaeus, uh, all the support staff, and <coughs> the plan is for uh, Implacable, so Apwar Trig Trigit ship, Nightcaller, Provocateur, which is a Nebulon B frigate, and Constrictor, which is a Corellian corvette. Uh, are going to assault this base, take out the remainder of all our base's staff, which would include uh, a lot of presumably Rogue Squadron support staff as well. And uh, so the Rogues, or so the race are getting ready to be part of this assault, and then at some point during the battle, they're gonna uh, they're trying to position themselves in a way to take out everything, uh, all the Imperial forces. But it comes to Trigit's attention before they jump into the system that it is a New Republic trap, that that New Republic forces are going to jump in behind them and kill everyone. So He's like, see ya. <laughs> yeah, so Trigit just decides, you know what, I'm going to stay here uh, while everyone else is already jumping. They get into the system, and so it's just, for Zinja's side, you just have Provocateur and Constrictor, and you have Nightcaller basically 2v1-ing until the New Republic reinforcements show up. But they they lose their entire bridge crew because they just get annihilated by... Uh, I think Provocateur does that. The ship also has a weird thing with shields. Not in this occasion, but it's like every time a ship enters battle, it doesn't have its shields up right away. 
Um, yeah, they're trying to save power, I guess, where they're only going yeah, to put yeah. shields up when they think they're going to be attacked. Even though they're assaulting a base, so they're you'd think they should be yeah. prepared for something, but they they don't. Uh, so they just destroy the provocateur or the uh, constrictor's bridge, and they. They then do kind of the same thing they did against the Lancer in... Uh, I'm going to say Wedge's Gamble? That's in number one. Or, is that in Rogue Squadron? Th but either way, one of the earlier Squadron. books. And I was wondering how they just cut a a frigate in half like that, but since I found out it's a Nebulon B, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid Nebulon B. Kind of a well-constituted Imperial fleet, though, all things considered. Star Destroyer, three support ships. Yeah. Seen worse. But uh, what did you guys think about Wraith Squadron's casualty rate so far? So far, because they've only lost Jasmine. Uh, mm -hmm. They do lose a lot in the Battle of Ession later on, but even up through the Battle of Marobe, they only lose Jasmine and I think Fanon Spleen or something. <laughs> yeah, they do kind of the same thing they do in Rogue Squadron, where they manage to keep all the pilots alive, but they slaughter like the secondary bridge crew or like. Whoever else. Yeah. Um, Did everyone in Rogue Squadron survive? Uh, they <coughs> lose, I, like... The Shistavenin? Think, they lose, like... They always lose, like... Oh, we got in a boss first in the book, squad. They See, lose yeah. Lujane and, I think, one other person. Uh, yeah. Lujane's then, killed. She's asleep. Yeah. Yeah. And Broar Jace goes missing at the end of Wedge's... Sure. At, uh, no. Is that at the end of Wedge's Gamble or one of the earlier ones? Mm -hmm. He he goes missing anyway. at the beginning of Wedge's Gamble, on then isn't it? And then doesn't he show up on right. Coruscant? No, he shows up on Typhera in Back to War. I think he's gone oh, yeah, for yeah. all of Kratos' trap. I don't know. But anyways, yeah. So they only lose Jasmine, but even though they're like half of them are described as like garbage pilots, yeah. Or, like, just okay. Like, yeah, the, the, you're right. The casualty rate is certainly a bit... It, it's kind of the, all the, like, the problem with these books. It's hard to keep track of 12 characters, and it's even harder if you're killing and replacing them. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, just, it would just be... Memory. <laughs> yeah, it'd be impossible to be like, okay, well, now Bing Bong the Quarren is Rogue <laughs> 9, and I have to remember that. And, like, yeah, you you can't just constantly have a cycling rotation mm -hmm. but i i think it's fine for yeah. <laughs> just for story's sake and sanity's sake towards the later part of the book they do get a lot more into just like using the call signs and i they only Awful. really assign it earlier on a couple times and i think grinders and uh cows get used a lot more often but everyone else it's like mm -hmm. i don't i don't know who the hell is who yeah it would be nice I, if they like just put in parentheses like yeah. who they meant. Or even uh, in the dramatis person at the start, if you could just flip back to that and be like, okay, this is. Oh yeah. Uh yeah. Well, in some of the other books, they they have the rogue designator, but maybe maybe in book two they'll have that. Sure. Because uh... I think in. Let's see. The other books they will say like Rogue One, but I, I might be mistaken. I don't. Know. I don't think so. Oh crap! I just closed the notes. Uh, but in that battle, I'm trying to see if there was anything particularly noteworthy with that. Anything you guys took away from that battle? That's the attack, right? Yeah, uh, on Marob where they lose their entire bridge crew and then they get the commendations afterwards. I actually thought the uh, the capital ship combat was pretty cool because like yeah. it talks mm -hmm. about like tactics and how they're uh, like basically what they do is because they the uh, the CR ninety is still incognito. They don't know that it's. Uh, New Republic, so they wait till the other ships go by, and then they basically just pound the the engines and whatnot with turbo lasers so they can't escape. It's mm -hmm. pretty cool to see. Like, I I don't think is who's it's still the uh, I guess the original 
captain who gets killed, I think. And Face just barely survives because he's on the... He basically spends most of this book on the bridge, too, because he they use him for their uh, deep fakes. Yeah, he's on, like, the, the rear auxiliary areas, so he manages to just barely survive. And yeah. uh, I think it's Wes who to calls, to the... too. Yeah. yeah. He was trying to run to the, the hangar when the ship got... <coughs> blown, when they got blown through because he was trying to join the battle but they had already vented it so he couldn't get in his X-Wing yeah and like Wes or someone else calls to the ship later and uh, they're trying to get the command crew and then face and is like what what the hell are you doing here <laughs> yeah um it, I don't know it, it's, it's just cool to see like a different perspective I, I guess we'll yeah. get more of that with like solo command and stuff there was one thing leading up to this when the Nightcaller was doing their uh, the rounds that we did miss that I wanted to just mention. Uh, they were talking about... Actually, no, it would have been after this with the raid on Ession, so never mind. We'll talk about that in a minute. But... Uh, uh, there is a mention of how they are... They were going to try to lure Rogue Squadron into a trap after this battle, and that's how what kind of spurs the uh, the final. last battle... And they they mentioned how they're going to destroy... We're going to annihilate them being Rogue Squadron even more thoroughly than I destroyed Talon Squadron. Which seems like a weird thing for them to bring up, because like, Talon Squadron is not a notable thing. Yeah, You'd assume like they're they... literally just off the... Yeah, that's right. Like they what did just... you think... Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, they, they were just trying to make Min worse without even knowing who he is. It just seemed excessive. <laughs> oh, yeah, because isn't he on the bridge at that point? Or, like, because they say something like Min, like, he thought he could hear Min grunt or something. Yeah, Face heard a noise, a muffled grunt from the hallway outside yeah, the comms yeah. Was Donos out Min's there? just over there, just fuming. <laughs> at this point, though, we've had quite a bit of uh, interaction with... Uh, the big big daddy himself, Mister Warlord Zinge, mustachioed Warlord Zinge. What did you guys think of his uh, portrayal? It's not much to go off of yet. I'm just like, yeah. It, we we kept hearing about him, and he he's mentioned right in the other yeah, four yeah. books. Yeah, quite a bit. And it's just like, I don't know why to fear this guy quite yet. Yeah. Well, oh, then he's got a big superstar destroyer. Yeah. That he's kind of a nice just hiding difference. from everyone. Yeah, and kind of like playing the economy game, like trying to get a little empire set up. It's, he's kind of a nice difference from like Isard, though, because he's he's reasonable, he's got a sense of humor, like he's not unduly cruel, um, at least at this point. Um, like he lets his uh, like subordinates kind of get away with a bit of lip sometimes, and like he's not like just... He's not just like boring and kind of evil to be evil you know what i mean yeah like if uh if trigid had tried a lot of what he says to zinge with isard or literally anyone else he probably yeah. would have been like oh what are you doing i'm i'm captain <laughs> evil mclordy dude but zinge is like okay yeah have fun buddy he's like you're lucky i'm fat <laughs> don't want to come over there <laughs> but when they're talking about the uh the guy who runs the company with the like the repulsor lift company that they're gonna get the TIE fighters from. I forget Raffin oh, or yeah. something. Yeah. Uh they I I looked up the guy's article on Wikipedia because I wanted to see if he was useful for mod stuff. But mm -hmm. the uh when when Zinj is talking to Face as Darillion, Zinj mentions, oh, he's gonna go into an early retire or into a retirement soon. And Faze is like, oh, should we, should we arrange pushing that up a bit later? And he's just like, no, like literally, he's going to retire. He's gonna like the go live in a cottage and write his memoirs, kind. Mm -hmm. Which was clearly just like a jokey, offhand comment about like this is the kind of retirement he's going for. But the Wikipedia article is <laughs> literally saying it is noted that he planned to retire to a cottage and write his memoirs. Like, no, that that isn't what he. <laughs> And this Wikipedia is why you shouldn't simple. take everything Wikipedia says as gospel. Yeah, I I still am mad at Wikipedia for the whole Jason Solo Darth Kaidas page naming situation, where they insist 
that he be named Darth Kydus instead of Jason. Don't like it. <laughs> because he's been redeemed, so he should be Jason? Yeah, and he spent most of his life as Jason. Like, if you're going to call Darth Vader Anakin on the page, like, what's the difference? Like, I guess technically the redemption is different, but Jason's kind of, like, retroactively redeemed. Yeah, He's still kind of say... a dick in the pool of memories, whatever. You think? I was like, maybe oh, th- maybe they named the people after <laughs> how they were known when they were last alive. Mm. That Yeah, that is the that is the technical... I guess the but I I would agree with rule. you. Jason Solo seems more appropriate. Yeah. Plus, there's the whole boobs page thing, which I made a video on. <laughs> yeah. Are you familiar right. with that, Alex? Yes. Uh. Someone, there's one edit that I that I made that someone always changes every like two or three weeks. It's like there's a few. There's one on Force Choke because in the new, well, in Legends and in Canon, you know when when Luke goes to. Uh, Jabba's palace and return the Jedi. And he waves off the no Gamorrean guards. Happened. Yeah. Well, a lot of people think that's a forced joke, which I, I understand. I always thought it was a mind trick, just saying get back. But regardless, um, the I think it's Last Command, and a bunch of new canon stuff as well, has said sp- explicitly that he's using a mind trick. People think it's a forced joke, and they keep editing the forced joke Wikipedia page to include Luke as one of the notable <laughs> practitioners, and I keep changing it back, and someone keeps reverting it. <laughs> There's oh, no way man. that was a force show. How do you... I don't... I can understand why people think that, because one of the Gamorreans, like, clutches at his throat, yeah. but... He's... When I was a kid, I always just... I mean, I still do think that he's just putting his hand up as, like, a guard, like... Yeah. You know, like... Because every other force joke in the series is accompanied by that sound, you know, the... the gurgling? <sighs> No, like the it's it's almost like a rush of wind, like mm. whenever someone force chokes, it's like, <sighs> and it's like a little. There's I think there's even a little musical cue to it as well. But I understand what, but it's not canon. <laughs> yeah, it's so, important. So after the failed raid on, uh, on Marob, uh, they. So they they get Nightcaller repaired, they get a new bridge crew, and uh Darillion Face is still able to convince Zanj and Trigit that they're <coughs> that they're on their side, because everyone else in the battle conveniently dies, that's Imperial. Darillion escapes, and they're welcomed back into the fold, and they have like a three way conference call where Zinj, Trigit, and Darillion are like Oh, we don't even know how they were chasing the Nightcaller, but we're going to discuss with you right now exactly what our plans are to lure in and destroy Rogue Squadron. And I, I do have to commend Zinj based, like, going back to what we were talking about with how he, he didn't entirely suck, where Darillion was like, we need to destroy a bunch of things at once, and Zinj's like, hey, well, let's, let's not bite off more than we can chew here. Just destroying Rogue Squadron would be just amazing. So. Yeah, like, <laughs> huge morale boost for the Empire. So they uh, they talk about luring Rogue Squadron into Ession, and that's where we're going to have our final final battle in this book. Uh, there was there were the uh, awarding all the medals of valor and everything uh, to the newly promoted Captain Nightcaller, uh, to Kel for his uh, bravery with uh, with Jasmine. And we also get Tyria reinstated as a pilot, which is nice for her as well. Uh, any <laughs> thoughts on that stuff, guys? Um, what what did Tyria even get? What did, I forget what she did to. Oh, she got in a fight, right? Because she's yeah. kind of like this. The grinder. Where she, grinder right. said he would alter her scores jokingly, and then she beat well, him up. <laughs> jokingly. Uh, maybe arguably, maybe. I don't know. It's debatable. <laughs> yeah, because she's got like she was kind of a shit pilot, and then yeah, her like superior is kind of like her favorite. Her old superior was kind of like giving her. He was like trying to steal X wings, wasn't he? Yeah, he kind of like strong armed her basically. Where he was altering her scores the entire time, 
and then tried to get her to go along with stealing X wings for him or with him, or mm-hmm. misappropriating a lot of stuff. And uh, she threatened to expose him, and he's like, "Oh yeah, if you do that, then I'm gonna show everyone what your actual score should have been, and your records were falsified." So you can either let me do this and become the mediocre pilot you were born to be, or you can get kicked out too if you tell anyone. Yeah. Yeah. I. I mean, I don't know. It. The the book is wrapped up pretty nicely. Um, maybe a little too nicely with how all the pilots get over their like immense psycho psychological issues. Well, I don't. Well, you, they wrap that up, and then they have the last battle where they kill off like a third of the squad. So yeah, true. Um, I do like I I even though I, like I know Wedge isn't gonna die, I still always find it a little stressful when he's in the Tie Fighter. <laughs> yeah, kinda, just it, anyone in a Tie Fighter is like, oh god, why? <laughs> One shot. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> we kind of empathize with the Imperial pilots because it's like every single like hero in Rogue Squadron. There's like one scene where they're like, oh he. He hit me twice with my his cannons and my shields were down. It's like if you're in a tie, you're done, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. What about you, Corey? You have any thoughts about that last scene before the battle? Mm. Mm, not really. I like Kel's stuff. It seems like they're trying to wrap it up there, and then. Uh... He just needed a chance to run away from the battle, which we'll get to next. But I, I do like that it kind of brought that back to make sure no one had forgotten that Kel still had these issues because we we got at least two yeah. chapters without bringing it up. Uh, yeah, I was thinking it was after the battle that happened. So you're right. He, he does kind of revert, doesn't he? Yeah, the I I actually thought that the the book was ending with the with the Marobe stuff. So I would. I was kind of caught off guard by the fact that we went to Ession after that. Because I, I thought Tridget yeah. would like survive until uh, the next book at least, but I mm-hmm. I thought he died in Iron Fist. So I'm kind of glad he died. I didn't find him to be super compelling. To yeah. be oh, I, I really appreciated that they killed him. Yeah, I, 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 did I, was not really I was with you. I was like, yeah, he probably survives for a while. Like, uh, like Korn's old Corsac nemesis I can't yeah. remember, but yeah, when uh, they offed him, and in in a good way, a cool way, I liked his death. Yeah, yeah. Except he's like, isn't he? Doesn't he try to like, technically, doesn't he try to give give himself up right before he gets blasted by a torpedo? In like yeah. a second before the torpedo hits, he's like, well, about that surrender, because Wedge was like, yeah. if he surrendered, you have to accept it. So Dona shoots the torpedo before he surrenders. Yeah. Yeah, I like um I like during that last battle that General Som and his Defender Wing comes back from there and they spend some time in the uh or they feature in the first four books mostly the first. Uh, yeah, Rogue Squadron has a cameo squad. there. Uh, who's yeah. Rogue Two? Would that be Hobby at that point? Um, I don't know. I never remember. I don't, I don't remember. But uh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with because, this last battle, uh, Tycho would have taken Rogue One, so yeah. it could have been, could have been any, could have been anyone. Although Wedge said he was technically going to command both squadrons, so well, he was more of a commanding officer position rather than still being Rogue One. But I think they mm-hmm. replaced, they would have replaced Wedge with Hobby. Tycho would have taken an actual role in the squadron as squad leader. He took mm. Jansen with him, but I guess that does still leave one open spot. Either way. Yeah. I mean, they name drop a bunch of random... At one point when they've got, like, the fake rogue squad at the beginning, they name drop a bunch of rogues who, like... Like, one who appeared only in, like, the Truce of Pakura, which I thought was kind of funny. Mm. Um, there's a couple of Truce of Pakura references as well. What was the other one? Wedge talked about uh, how he had to shove his hand into that bomb. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there was, was like a page of, and a half about that. Yeah, I thought that was a fun little callback to like a book that's you know doesn't get a whole lot of yeah. features after this point. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, for the Battle of Ession, uh, 
they're basically going to have Rogue Squadron turn up. It's supposed to be an assault on Rogue Squadron, where they've set it up as a trap to lure in Rogue Squadron, and Rogue Squadron shows up in uh, what was the pirate base uh, of Super Freighter that was the used as the pirate base on M29 Z34682. Uh, Got him all, <laughs> and they... It was basically going to break up in orbit over Ession. The X-Wings would be part of it, and they'd all fly out and start blowing stuff up, but then Nightcaller is there to help, and a bunch of other uh, fighter elements from the New Republic would show up, including General Crespins and his A-Wings, and I think also uh, General Som and his Y-Wings were there. Basically, all the major squadrons from both both parts of the series, and they would be taking out Trig- Is it? I think it's just... Uh, Trigit and his ISD. They were supposed to have some fighter support from the surface, but Page's commandos had gone in and blown up uh, any access that they had, so they couldn't get their fighter reinforcements. Uh, and uh, we do get a lot more with Trigit and Gara Pedithel, who is mm-hmm. actually a Rogue Squadron. I don't think it's quite clear at this point. What yeah, we is. we don't we're not supposed to know yet, but she kind of shows herself by the end to be an agent of the New Republic, and it doesn't clarify who she is yet. But yeah. she's the only competent Imperial in the book, and turns out she's not Imperial. So she's, yeah, because she's like super competent almost. Yeah, like she predicts like multiple things, and and uh, the captain of course has a crush on her, right? Yeah. They're yeah, sorry, the. Uh, I should see if she's amenable to a liaison later, <laughs> is I believe how he phrases it. Teach me teach me your lines, master. <laughs> she doesn't seem like she'd be too into it, which is what I really like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's still a step up from she leaned over and I got a view of her cleavage <laughs> from, uh, from Rogue Squadron. Sort of. Not a big upgrade. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, yeah, so they... I I actually really liked how this battle was written. Uh, I don't know that there's a lot for us to dissect in the early stages. Mm -hmm. We get Kel running away from the battle, and Runt kind of chases him down, telling him that's his bad voice. And... (laughs) Or his bad mind, and then eventually yeah. he thinks about Tyria having to come and shoot him down, so he turned around, and no one seems to really care that much, so good on yeah. him. <laughs> it's pretty cool when they're fighting the Star Destroyer, because it's like, even though they've got a huge advantage over the ship, it's just so massive, and they've got so little firepower that they're, like, chipping away at it. Like, it's unshielded, but they're, like, basically taking chunks out of it with, like, turbo lasers yeah. and torpedoes and stuff, until they eventually full-on fly an X-Wing in there. Yeah, Grinder and Fallon, uh, they make a hole in the bottom, and Wedge says, yeah. like, just get out of there, but they decide to fly in and make uh, calm interruption noises by rubbing their microphones while Wedge is telling <laughs> them to get out of there. That was funny, yeah. And then they both died. Yeah, Fallon wanted to be the first person to uh, destroy an ISD from by like reaming it apart from the inside so uh they take out all the internal systems trigit gets out uh pedithel gets out and implacable starts like falling towards the planet and my favorite line in the book happens at that point where nightcaller is kind of in the way uh between the planet and implacable and uh when wedge is trying to get the ship out of the way it des- it's described as Nightcaller shot from beneath the descending capital <laughs> ship like a bar of soap squirting yes. from under a foot. <laughs> it's such a good image. Like it, it, it's kind of cool how the Nightcaller, like how it is during that battle too. Like it's it's like using because the sensors are out because of some basically technology they've got installed nearby, and they're hiding their like visual like they're hiding their themselves from with like they're kicking up sand basically mm. with thrusters isn't it like or are they using i don't remember if they're using thrusters or because they, they have like a 
tractor beam too that they're using. I don't remember which is for which. I thought the tractor beam was because like they were pointed straight down at the ground, right? Yeah. So I think maybe the tractor beam was to hold on to yeah, I the think. ship. And then the engines are are uh, making the dust go flying everywhere. Kind of cool. Like it's very it's very visual if you know what I mean. Hmm. Uh, the after Trigid is leaving, there is some disagreement on the Implacable over whether they su should surrender or not, because they kind of just want to kill everyone, and then uh, we get the voice of Suntir Fell, who is not actually there, uh, who's telling the Imperial forces that they should take Wedge's offer of just ceasing hostilities, if not actually surrendering. And uh, Petithel sends out the message to chase down Trigit, who's trying to flee in some interceptors. So Donos and Crespin start chasing them down. And uh, that's when we get the line about, you have to sur take the surrender if he tries to. And we get to <laughs> see some fancy A-wing flying. And ultimately, Trigit does explode. It's pretty awesome. And he manages, like... Because Trigit's in like a, uh, he escapes in a very imperial manner. He's got his hidden, upgraded tie <coughs> interceptor with a hyperdrive and shields and stuff, but not quite as fast as a normal ship. So yeah, it's pretty you're reminiscent. Like basically... Sorry. Oh no, go ahead. You're gonna say it's pretty reminiscent of uh, Isard. Yeah, when Tycho yeah. and uh, and Corn are chasing her down at the end of the book. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. But we no close out. This time. <laughs> we or other. Minos gets his uh, his uh, revenge, blowing up Trigit, and we close out the book with everyone on Borlaeus at the famous Borlaeus beaches, <laughs> lounging around in their skimpy bathing suits, which the book is make sure to highlight. Yep. With Akbar sitting down and thank yep. Too much chest hair. Wedge does, or Akbar does ask why Wedge isn't wearing a, a nice skimpy bathing suit, though. Calls it a scrap, <laughs> I think. He walks away disappointed as well. <laughs> the Akbar, <laughs> the Ak the Admiral climbed awkwardly in. You're still fully dressed, Commander. Shouldn't you be wearing a scrap and enjoying the weather and water as they are? <laughs> it's a beautiful Akbar voice. It's just been doing Star Wars audiobooks in the nineteen nineties. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted that. <laughs> I'm not really as close to the wraiths as I am to the rogues, sir. I think I'd make them uncomfortable. Yeah, because you've been just berating them for yeah, four hundred like pages. <laughs> yeah, like you're expo you've exploited their mental weakness and are getting mad at them for for it now. <laughs> yeah, I'd say they probably don't like you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that uh, that closes out Race Squadron. Uh, yeah. I guess we can't take. I guess we can take questions cause the, from the chat because I have pulled in some people to listen to the live stream, quote unquote. But uh, we did have that one email. If there's any closing thoughts you guys had on the book, like that, I will actually, Alex. We usually we end by uh, ranking the ones we've listened to so far or the ones we've. Uh, read so far and i guess since you haven't been doing that if you want to just weigh in on where ray squadron kind of fits in in your greater hierarchy of star wars books you know I'll, I'll say since i just recently read alphabet squadron and i really really loved alphabet squadron then going back to wraith squadron i was like i wonder if i will like alphabet squadron less because like i just i recall mm. loving the x-wing books growing up and i did read the previous or the first four within a few years at least as an adult uh but i hadn't read this one as an adult so reading it and like i i feel like alphabet squadron holds up to it but like yeah i still really liked wraith squadron a lot so uh but it also kind of validated my opinion of alphabet squadron <laughs> for me Yeah, Alphabet Squadron is kind of, it's definitely set up like it could be uh, an early 
because you, you don't get like the whole high flying action of like changing the galaxy or anything, but you don't with um, you know, Rogue Squadron either, like X Wing number one or in yeah, this book. That's like I kind of recalled the missions being way more grand and important and stuff. And I was like, Alphabet Squadron, like, I like the characters a lot. The missions that they were on didn't seem monumental, yeah, at least not in I the agree. first book. Uh, but then yeah, reading Wraith Squadron, I was like, I don't know. This isn't a huge, important mission either. It's more about the characters, and I still enjoyed it. So they're mm-hmm. comparable. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. So our, our email question from Ian Miller kind of ties into that as well. Uh, where he says Austin fo- focuses heavily on developing all 12 members of, ense- of the ensemble instead of just Wedge and Corn. How do you think this matters in your rankings and enjoyment of the books? Uh, so I guess, uh, do you agree with that? And do you think that squadron focus, uh, if it's there, makes it better? Or I think it's I think the book suffers a bit because it doesn't have any character as likable as Corn or as mm. like. Um... Not bombastic, but as like just as charismatic, I guess, as Corn. Um, or even I think the secondary rogues are still better. Um, but I-, I agree that like, like for example, I knew that like Thanin and Face would act a certain way. Um, and I-, I guess even with like, you know, main characters in the originals four book. Besides for corn, I don't know. I, I did feel kind of more personality, but you do lose having a strong kind of narrative character because corn is always there. It's either corn or wedge, and in this, it's either uh, it's Kel or wedge, and I, I definitely prefer the former. I think. Hmm. What about you? And I, I kind of touched on it earlier with uh, how I feel like they it doesn't quite go as far with giving the development to the other wraiths as uh the first rogue squadron book does so even after this i don't or after this first wraith squadron book i don't really feel like we know uh a lot of the rogues as well as we end up knowing like oral who yeah no one's quite as awesome as oral like runt is no oral i I agree i love oral yeah and oral alone kind of just makes rogue that much better Mm -hmm. but uh, you still kind of get to know the F- Lujane and Neary Forge. Uh, little Biggs. Yeah. <laughs> little Gavin. <laughs> All the rogues, I feel like you get a pretty... They get a lot of character development, and I don't know if we're there yet with uh, with Ray Squadron. Do we see them in the next books? I don't, I, it's like You said you've never read these, right, Corey? I've... Never read Iron Fist and Solo Command. I don't mm-hmm. remember if I've read Wraith Squadron before. I don't think I had. Like, I don't remember to what degree Rogue Squadron is in the next ones, even. I don't think they are. They get mentioned a bit. I'm actually going to pull the next ones out and see if they're on the list of characters. Because uh, it's been ages for me. I, I read the uh, Rogue Squadron ones the year before last, but I stopped at number four, so it's been... Basically, since I was a kid, since I read these. Like, I don't think we get uh, a lot of them until, like, I Jedi or something again. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's... You get the Rogue Squadron support personnel of Cover, Chunky, Gate. Squeaky, famous, Tony. Yeah, so... Rogues. <laughs> it doesn't look like they... Back into that very majorly. Solo Command, it does list Tycho, Scotian. Yeah, it lists both squadrons for Solo Command, so I think we do get a lot more of them there. And of course, I think we'll probably see them in uh, Courtship of Princess Leia, too. Well, not actually, because it came first, but... Actually, I'd imagine like Isar's Revenge like... would be heavily rogue, right? Yeah, because Isard's Revenge, I remember, has a lot of corn chapters in it. Because mm. it's like corn meets Isard. And so I guess, uh, Justin, where's this? Uh, where's Wraith Squadron going to fall on your your ranking? I'm still so at a power. Can you read me my rankings? Yeah. So <laughs> right now, uh, Justin's rankings go: Plaggy's in first position. 
then Rogue Squadron, Back to War, Wedge's Gamble, Truce of Bakura, and Kratos Trap. Mine are the same except switch. Uh, actually, mine go Plagueis, Back to War, uh, Rogue Squadron, Wedge's Gamble, Truce of Bakura, Kratos Trap. I had uh, I had Kratos, or sorry, I had Back to War after Wedge's Gamble, right? Uh, no, you had Back to War, then Wedge's Gamble. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'd you can switch if you this... want. If it's really sunk in over the last mm-hmm. two weeks. You can put uh, Back to War down one if you want to change where the Back to War is. <laughs> uh, oh, this is tough. For me, this is either my... Yeah, it's either my third or my fourth favorite of the X-Wing books. I really liked it, though. Um, I'm excited to see what... One thing I really like noticed in this book, it's only a little scene, but the way that Alston wrote Han and Chewie was w- way better than um, they've been written so far. So I'm just like the way the, like Chewie exits the the Falcon and like lets it a big roar. And it's like whether that was to say something or just claim it as Wookiee territory, I was like, that sounds just like something Chewie would do. <laughs> um, and the way he they write Han and stuff, it's just like, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I'm excited to see more of the sort of the legacy characters brought in. Uh, for me, I guess I really liked it, but I think I'd put it right under Wedge's. All right, so you're gonna put it fifth overall for you. So it'll be Plagueis, Rogue Squadron, Back to War, Wedge's Gamble, Wraith Squadron, Trees of Occur, and then Kratos Trap. That sounds harsh, but I really love those five. All right. What about you? Uh, I guess for me, I'm probably going to put it above Trusa Bakura. So, yeah, I guess that puts it uh, number five for me as well. So I'd be at Plagueis, Back to War, Rogue Squadron, Wedge's Gamble, Wraith Squadron, Bakura, Kratos. So, Alex, you can't do this, but what would you, like, what are, like, say... <laughs> that just sounds three... so harsh. <laughs> oh, you, you can't, <laughs> you can't do, this. do this. Well, you can. I just figure you probably don't remember. Um, if you know if you know the uh, those books that we mentioned, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. If not, maybe just three Legends books you really like. Mention what you've read again. Uh, Plagueis, uh, Rogue Squadron 1-4, to four, um, this, and Teresa Bakura. Uh... All right, Plagueis goes. Hmm. Man, that's tough. I probably put, I might put Rogue Squadron at the top, and then Plagueis. Uh, the other three. I'll send you the list if you want to have a visualization there. I'm trying to decide. The other three X-wing books kind of run together for me. I really like the Liberation of Coruscant, though, so I'd probably put Wedges. Me too. Gamble next, then. Uh. I remember not being as into Kratos and Back to War, so I might put Wraith Squadron below Wedge's Campbell and then Kratos, Back to War, and Truce of Bakura definitely goes at the bottom for me. Mm. I remember yeah. I, I read that one in the past four years or so, and I remember mm. just not being into it, which surprised me, because I remember, like, when I was a kid reading all the books, I just didn't care at all. I was like, I love all of this, but reading it again i was like this is kind of boring it's pretty dull yeah yeah the you, i think you, the, you don't like big dinosaurs <laughs> i think just Blazers. the amount of nothing that happens in kratos trap is the only thing that saves so Shusha Bakura from being at the bottom of our list um so i think that's basically it Corey. what so next we're gonna go straight on we're gonna keep on great squadron right i oh, so we're gonna keep on this sort of trilogy then what's our plan are we gonna do courtship and then thrawn or do you want to throw tatooine ghost in there or do you want to throw <laughs> like a callback or something what do you think i think uh we're definitely going to do solo command and iron fist next uh yeah. then we could even possibly do a jump back uh to something else and then go straight into thrawn and save courtship and tatooine ghost for uh for a future thing so we're not staying too close in the time period Maybe. Yeah, but then we'll never find out the end of Zinge. 
That's, that's chapter. true. Uh, we can no just do the even... one chapter. <laughs> we have a whole episode on one chapter of courtship. <laughs> I really like the font they use in the third edition. <laughs> yeah, I guess anyway, we'll, we'll probably figure do it out. We... something like that. But we're we're heading towards the Thrawn trilogy there. But I think uh, we'll we'll know with each episode what the following one's going to be, and I think that's good enough. Yep. Um. So thanks a bunch, Alex, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks. Literally any time yeah, you want to join. I know you're a busy man, but any time you want to join us, we'd love to have you. Yeah. Um, you're a well, nice voice of reason among I have us idiots. Until November, probably, <laughs> when the floodgates open and then everything comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the technical difficulties this episode, so uh, thanks for sticking with us through that, and thanks to everyone who listened and watched through that. Sorry for the lack of a stream there. Uh, yikes. <laughs> But yeah. Uh... Oh, I thought I lost you. <laughs> no. I was like, oh crap, my phone. I thought my phone died. Nope, just a silence. <laughs> um, I don't think I got anything else to say. I enjoyed this book. It was fun reading it. I look forward to it next, not next week, the week after. Yep, same here. Thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Thanks for having me. See you guys next time. The whole Senate.